Well, good morning again, and happy Sabbath to everybody. How many of you, well, let me ask you this. Could, do you think you could estimate, if I asked you, how many promises you have made to people throughout your lifetime? All right. How many promises have you made to people this week? Dozens? Hundreds? A few? Two? Okay. Would you say that throughout your lifetime you've probably made thousands of promises? So let me ask you this. Try to estimate what percentage of those promises you keep. 50%, 60%. I mean, things happen sometimes, right? We promise we're going to help someone with something, and then something comes up and we can't do it. I had promised to be home earlier, and then two feet of snow fell. You know, and, and leaving when I wanted to initially was difficult. Plus, I wanted to stay through the storm anyway, right? So that, that was part of it. You know, it, it's hard. We promise our kids things are, we're going to do something, and then something comes up and we can't do it, and we end up breaking our promises. I, I don't know. Do you know how many promises there are in the Bible? So I, I researched this quite a bit, and I came across many, many sites and lots of estimates, somewhere between 7,000 and 9,000 promises. I settled on a couple studies that seemed to be more in-depth, where in the King James Version, they said there were some 8,100 promises in the Bible. What percentage of those promises that God has made to us through his written word, what percentages of those do you think he's, keep it, he's kept? 100%. Isn't that amazing? So I want you to listen to the opening scripture for today. Sorry, I thought these hands would do this once and it would stop. <laughs> but, but it just keeps going and it's driving me crazy, but, but I, I don't know how to stop it. So let me read through the opening scripture. Now listen, it says, since we believe human testimony, that's how it starts. Saying, look, we believe it when people tell us stuff, right? Someone tells us something, we might believe that. Since we believe human testimony, surely we can believe the greater testimony that comes from God. And God has testified about his son. All who believe in the son of God know in their hearts that this testimony is what? It's true. Those who don't believe this are actually calling God a liar. Because they don't believe what God has testified about his son. You know what? Let me give you the old, my usual disclaimer here. This verse, as well as everything I'm going to talk about today, is based in biblical principles and comes from the Bible. I believe that the Bible is the holy, inspired, written word of God. Amen. If you don't believe that, you're wrong, first of all. But if you don't believe that, then much of what I say here is not going to make sense. Okay? All right. It's said because they're a liar because they don't believe that God is what God has testified about his son. And this is what God has testified. That's what he said. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. And whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. Amen? Amen? But first, on my way home, I stopped in Greenville, Tennessee, where um, Sandra's going to be moving, and I saw and spent some time with Canaan and Patty. Amen. Now, when's the last time you guys saw Canaan? Oh, my goodness. Long time. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> so that's me in the middle. Patty on the right and Mountain Man wow. on the left. He looks like a mountain. <coughs> he is. He's got such a ministry going there. Awesome. The two of them with their health ministry. It's awesome. just amazing. Awesome. I mean, when they left here, they just blossomed. Awesome. Yep, into their ministry. Amen. And feel free to support them in every way you can. All right. 
So let me ask you this, what is a promise? Let's get through the definitions first. Well, as a noun, a promise is a declaration or assurance that one will do a particular thing or that a particular thing will happen. As a verb, it assures someone uh, that it assures someone that one will definitely do give or arrange something, undertake, or declare that something will happen. It's me promising you that I'm going to do something or something is going to happen or we're going to do something. It's an assurance that whatever it is that I say is going to take place. Biblically, here's what I think defines the promise. This is from 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4. It says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself, himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious what? Promises. promises. And these are the promises that enable you, me, us, to share his divine nature. Those promises aren't so that we become rich or well all the time, whatever. It's so that we can share in God's divine nature and listen, escape the world's what? Corruption caused by human desires. God's promises fulfill a divine need in each of us to separate us from the corruption in this world that's caused by our own desires. Mm. How many of you are familiar with or have read through Psalm 91? Maybe my favorite. Because I believe that all of the promises of God are encapsulated in this psalm. There's only 16 verses. And I'm going to put them on the screen. And I'm going to read them. And if you want to read them with me aloud, I would encourage that. Because when I read it and you hear it, it, it has an impact on your brain. Um, it, it fires off um, some neurons. But if you read it aloud and your brain hears your voice say these things, it imparts a deeper ability for you to build memory and recognition. Okay? First four verses. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. Promise, for he will rescue you from every trap. Promise, and protect you from every deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Not a bad start for four verses, huh? Five through eight. <clears throat> Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in the darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. Kind of addresses this health crisis we have right now. 9 through 12. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. Now wait, it doesn't say that evil won't come upon us, does it? It says that it won't conquer us. It doesn't say that we're not going to be subject to hard times and tough decisions and attacks. But we're like weebles. We wobble, but we don't fall down. No plague will come near your home, <clears throat> for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Or colloquially, you won't stub your own toe. Finally, the last four verses. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says... I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. 
When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. Isn't that amazing? We should be reading that psalm every single day, at least once, if not more. So what I want to do is I want to take and I want to categorize, just because that's how my brain works. I want to build buckets for these promises. And I found from reading through this that there are seven buckets, seven categories of biblical promises. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read you scripture for each of these buckets. And if you want to write them down, you can. Because if you're experiencing anything surrounding one of these categories, I believe these verses, repeated, 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 can help to bring us out of the darkness. Does that make sense? All right, let's look at them. The first promise category is, I will be with you. I will protect you. God says, I will be your strength. I will answer you. That's a big deal. Because when we pray, we sometimes wonder, is God really answering our prayers? Does he hear what we're saying? I will provide for you. I will give you peace. That's probably my biggest prayer, you know. Well, people say, what are you going to do? What's the first thing you do when you get to heaven? Well, I'm going to ask Jesus questions. I'm going to go sit at the big table. I want about a, a million or two years just to sit on the porch of a cabin somewhere overlooking the great city and just have it be quiet and just experience the peace that exceeds all human understanding that we get when we call upon the Lord, even in this world. I will always love you. So first he promises that he's going to be with us always, right? This is like reassurance that God's going to be with us in the good times as well as the bad. When it's rain and stormy waters, when the sunshine is out, when we have a pandemic and when we don't, that God's going to be with us. Even when we choose to be steeped in a lifestyle of sin and destruction, He's there calling us to higher ground. Mm -hmm. Even when we're in the depth of our sin, in the darkness, he still calls for us. And he still is with us. And he still wants us to come out of the darkness. Isaiah 41.10 says, Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Matthew 28, 20 says, Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. Here's a promise. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Romans 8, 38 and 39 says, And I am convinced, this is, again, this is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Absolutely convinced of it. In fact, the only thing that separates me from God's love is me. And that's me choosing not to love God. But that never stops God from loving me. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Why is it that nothing in creation can separate us from the love of God? Because God is the creator. You think he'd create something that would separate us? He created all that there is. And he did it because he loves us so much. In fact, I know I've said this before, but God loves me so much that he allows me to suffer the consequences of my behaviors. Because if I didn't, 
I wouldn't change. I will protect you. We're Christians. We're Seventh-day Adventists, but we are Christians. Which means that Jesus Christ, God's only Son, is our Savior in every single circumstance. There's not a situation that I can think of where anything or anyone other than Jesus Christ would be my personal Savior. Can you? Not just eternally, but day to day. In my day to day decisions and crises and stress and chaos, Jesus is there every moment of the, of the day to save me. I call upon him many times for protection. And when I do, he's there. He heals us, but according to his own divine will. He goes before us, you know that? To protect us from danger. I wonder when we get to heaven, I wonder if we'll see this. I wonder if I'll be able to look back and see all the situations that I was walking into where God sent an angel ahead of time and he cleared the way for me. I could tell you some stories, which I don't have time today, about situations that I put myself in where I should have been done. But some miraculous event occurred and it didn't happen. That God sent an angel ahead. You know, I, I, I remember Delia's uh, accident with the van when she was T-boned. And um, uh, the van went flying across uh, the highway and it wedged between those poles. And if it hadn't, it would have flipped and rolled. And I believe that, call me crazy, God had an angel that went ahead and prepared that whole situation because it wasn't Delia's time. Deuteronomy 20, verse 4. It says, For the Lord your God is going with you. He will fight for you against your enemies, and he will give you victory. If God is for us, who can be against us? What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean people can't be against us. Because there are people that are against us as Christians, as Adventists, as human beings. It means that they don't overcome us. They don't have victory over us because we're on God's side. Psalm 34, 17 and 18 says, The righteous cry out, and the Lord does what? There's a promise. We cry out, and the Lord hears us. And he delivers us out of all of our troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a con contrite spirit. You know, what's a contrite spirit? Those are humble. People who are humble. Who recognize their weakness and their frailty. And they present that before the Lord. I am weak, but he is strong. Psalm 91, 7. We, we talked about this before. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, uh, these evils will not touch you. And 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 9. Another one of my favorite verses. We are pressed on every side by troubles. Does anybody feel that way right now? I mean... You know, I, we haven't had a television since, I don't know, 1992. And I'm really glad because I don't want to be stuck with this 24-hour news cycle. Once in a while, though, you know, pick up the phone, I get the email, it says, hey, there's news, and I read it, and it's just, it's terrible. And, and, and what I can see is that the media, it feels like, maybe I'm wrong, that they're making their, their place by instilling fear in everybody about everything. I don't know what the purpose is to make us all so afraid that we become paralyzed with fear and we can't function anymore. 
we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we're not what? We're not crushed. How many of you are a weeble? Do we have weebles in here? Because I'm a weeble. I'm a weeble. I wobble. You remember the weebles? I had one. Bam, you punch it and it, boom, and it comes back up. My parents got me a clown one one time. I don't do well with clowns. Maybe that's why. You know? But weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. We are not crushed. We are perplexed. We get confused because we don't know what's true sometimes. But we're not driven to despair because we call upon Jesus Christ to protect us. We're hunted down, but we are never abandoned by God. We wobble, but we don't fall down. We get knocked down. Sometimes we get knocked in the nickel seat, but we're not what? Destroyed. We're not destroyed. Amen. We just have to call on Jesus Amen. and trust in his divine protection. Not just for our eternal life, guys. We got to do this every day in our everyday life. I will be your strength. You ever have times when you feel like you've lost your momentum? You know, your direction? You know, we have all these laws of physics. We have one about energy and about momentum that says that an object in motion tends to stay at motion and an object at rest tends to stay at rest. And those times when we feel lost and overwhelmed and we stop, it takes a lot more energy to get us going again than it does for us to maintain our forward motion. Here's the problem. In those times of despair, I'll speak for me, I don't have the energy required to get moving again. Have you ever felt like that? You're in a hole and you can't get out. You can't even see light. And what do we do? We call upon Jesus. Why? Because it's his strength that pulls us out. It's not ours. Sometimes I have to pray for God to make me willing to pray for something good to happen for me. Sometimes I can get into such places of despair and despondency that I don't feel like God can, can help me. Am I the only one? No. 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 And I can't get myself out of that hole. I will be there until I die if I don't call upon Jesus to come pull me out. Philippians 4.13 says what? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I don't have to worry about it. Psalm 46, 1 to 3 says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Bring it on. Don't tempt the Lord thy God, but... If it's going to happen, let it happen. I'm not going to be afraid. Nehemiah 8.10 says, Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Isaiah 40.29 says, He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. You know, I mean, again, I can't tell you how many times I feel weak and powerless. And I cannot do this on my own. Philippians 4.13, we just read, For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And Ephesians 6.10, a final word. Let this be it. Be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. It doesn't say, be strong. You know, it's like the, the one that says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Read the rest of that. It's not about me being strong enough to resist the devil. I can't resist the devil, period. But with Jesus Christ, I can. If I put on the full armor of God, I can resist anything. But I can't do it on my own. Jesus is my strength. He says, I will answer you. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call to me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and mighty things. You know? Sometimes I pray for myself and other people and I can just hardly wait to see the results. Pray for patience. 
What? Oh. But you do not. Yeah, that's a bummer. Sorry. <laughs> do not know. Thank you. I can fix it. Okay. I prayed for patience. God gave me kids. <laughs> Careful what you pray for. Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes it's no. Sometimes it's maybe or wait. Right? It's all good. How he answers our pleas is not up to us. It's up to him. And if we have a problem with that, then we're questioning God's providence. That's a problem. Because it, if we're going to ask someone for help, we don't control what their answer is going to be. Hey, I need some help up at the house doing something. You know, you better say yes. And be there today or whatever. You know, it doesn't work that way. It's all good. Psalm 38, 15 says, For I hope in you, O Lord, you will answer, O Lord, my God. Psalm 17, 6, and the Psalms, by the way, are wonderful for the promises. I have called upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my speech. This is the, the song that we sing before prayer, right? That we ask God to incline his ear to us. Isaiah 65, 24 says, I will answer them before they even call me. He knows what we need, don't we? We do that with other people. I know what somebody needs, but they got to ask me for help. If they don't ask me for help, then maybe they don't need it as bad as they think. You know? You want something? I'm not a mind reader. God is. But if, if, I, if, if you want help from me, you got to ask me for help. While they are still talking about their needs, while we are in prayer, I'll go ahead and answer their prayers. Isn't that amazing? What, what, we, the story of Jesus and, and the, the soldier and his kid was sick and dying. and While he was still speaking to Jesus, the child was healed. I mean, we don't have that kind of power. How about I will provide for you? I know a lot of people who live with different levels of different types of needs. Financial needs, health needs, uh, personal needs. Life can be daunting, right? I mean, it can be really hard to get along in life, especially when, when we're in trouble in different areas, when we're sick, when we're financially devastated, when when we have family problems or relationship problems uh, that are going on. But the Bible says that no matter what, God's going to provide. Maybe not always the way that we want or think. I had, we had a, a brother in the church many years ago, and him and I were talking about tithing, and it says, you know, God will just open the heavens and pour blessings out on us. Just test me, God says. And he said, and he was an older... Gentlemen, I've been tithing all my life, he said, and I still live in relative squander, you know, in, in poorness. God's never opened those windows and poured the blessings out on me, and I couldn't believe it because he was, to him, a, a blessing was a financial thing. You know, it wasn't about maybe relationships or how revered he was in our church or how much people loved him and the knowledge and the wisdom that he brought, you know, uh, I, I don't know. I think that we need to, when we do make these prayers, we need to let God answer them the way based on what our needs are as he perceives them, not, not the things that we think that we want. I heard someone say once, my wanter is broken. That's my problem. <laughs> Psalm 146.7 says he gives justice to the oppressed and food to the hungry. The Lord frees the prisoners. You think it was just, it's just the president and the governors that can give pardons. It's not. It's God that gives us ultimate freedom. 
Matthew 6, 31 and 32 says, So don't worry about these things, saying, What will we eat? And what will we drink? And what will we wear? Wah, wah, wah. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your Heavenly Father already knows all your needs. These aren't things we should be worrying about. Luke 12, 31 says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else, the righteousness of the kingdom of heaven, and he'll give you everything else that you need. Psalm 81, 10 says, For it was I, the Lord your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it with good things. Here's mine. He will give you peace. I want peace. When we invite Jesus into our hearts, he will give us the greatest peace that anyone has ever known. The peace that exceeds all human understanding. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? I, I will ask someone, have you ever experienced, have you ever experienced a peace that exceeds all human understanding? I'm like, how do I know if it exceeds all human understanding and all I have is human understanding, right? How do I know if I've experienced that peace? But I have. I've been, have you ever been in that place, that zone, where for some period of time, it's like everything just turns to white noise and it's all okay no matter what's going on. In the midst of the, of the chaos and the noise and the crisis, all of a sudden everything's just, it's okay. Have you ever had that? I think that's the peace that exceeds all human understanding because most people can't understand how you could feel okay in the midst of all these of things that are going on when it's bad things around us. He gives us a spirit of peace, not a spirit of fear, guys. John 14, 27 says, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. I'll take it. You don't even have to wrap that one up for me. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Don't try to get it somewhere else. There's only one place that that gift of peace comes from, and that's through our personal, personal, one-on-one -on -one relationship, our love relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the only place it comes from, guys. We can't find it from anything or anyone else out in the world, and if we do, it's temporary, and it just leads to destruction. Colossians 3.15 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And be what? Thankful. Be thankful for what we got. Wait. You get what you get, and you don't throw a fit. Right? Isn't that what we tell the kids? <laughs> Philippians 4, 6-7. Fourth one of my favorite verses that I love. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and supplication, petition, with thanksgiving. Do you read that? Yeah. It doesn't just say with prayer and supplication it says with thanksgiving present your request to god no matter what the answer is thank you god for just listening to me that's all i want sometimes i just want god to hear me i don't care what happens after that i just want to know that he's listening to my prayers and the peace of god which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in christ jesus and finally I will always love you. Now here's where a sense of peace comes for me. It, it, it's the result of me doing my part, trusting in Jesus, and knowing that, that through God's grace and mercy that I can grow in gratitude. Right? Gratitude's a great thing. That no matter what happens, no matter where I am, or what I'm doing, God still loves me. He allows me to make my own choices. He allows me to suffer the consequences of the bad decisions that I make. Um, Susan tells me everything happens for a reason. She says sometimes the reason is you made really bad decisions. <laughs> and that's true. And in the midst of the bow of Despond, in, in the fiery furnaces, God still loves me. 1 John 3, 1 says, See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children. And that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world, they don't recognize that we're God's children. Why? Because they don't know him. If you never knew your brother or sister, how would you know that they come from the same parent? 
you wouldn't. 1 John 4.16 says, We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love. That's something we should all try to really internalize. I want you to think about that. It's not that God loves. God is love, and he's not capable of anything else but love. And all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And finally, Jeremiah 29, 11. He says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster. Guys, this noise, this crisis, this doesn't come from God. Controversy doesn't come from God. Fear doesn't come from God. That comes from Satan. What comes from God is eternal peace. But we have to seek it. We got to do our part. We got to get off of our chairs and pray and seek other people and give our testimony and be a witness and study the Bible. I mean, it's all pretty simple stuff. There's nothing complex about this, you know? It says to give us a future and a hope. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Would we do that for someone else? Would I sacrifice for someone if they continue to do something that I know is wrong or I've asked them not to do? Wow. I don't think I'm that big a person. No. I'd like to be because for no, there is no greater love that one would give his life for a friend. Isn't that what the Bible tells us? That's what Jesus did for us. He's the example for that. In conclusion, See, I'm getting better at, at this landing. In conclusion, some preachers, when they say in conclusion, it's not. When I say it, it is. This comes from the Ministry of Healing, one of my favorite readings, actually. It says, let us be hopeful and courageous. It goes on to say, he knows, who's he? God knows our every necessity. To the omnipotence of the King of Kings, our covenant-keeping God. So our promise-keeping God, right? That's what it says here. Unites the gentleness and care of the tender shepherd. His power is what? Absolute. And it is the pledge of the sure fulfillment of his promises to all who trust in him. So here, here's what this is saying. His power is Resolute, absolute, unquestioning, it, it is what it is. And it's the pledge that he will fulfill all of those promises that he makes to us because he can. He has the means for the removal of every difficulty that those who serve and respect the means he employs through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving may be sustained. His love is as far above all other love as the heavens are above the earth. He watches over his children with a love that is measureless and everlasting. Wow. I don't know what else to say. I am uplifted. I survive because of the promises of God. If they weren't there, I don't think I'd make it, guys. I just don't think I could make it through all this, not knowing that God has promised to protect me and to love me always and to be there for me and to listen to me and to answer my prayers. Here's my challenge for this week. Because Psalm 91 has just a few hundred words in it, and most of us read it about 120 to 150 words per minute. So it doesn't take you more than a few minutes to read it. I'm going to ask you, and I'm, I haven't done this. I'm going to do this with you. Let's commit Psalm 91 to memory. Let's do that. Let's commit it to memory. To memory. I mean, all of you could remember the theme song to Gilligan's Island right now if I asked you. We can, we can remember, we can memorize this song. There's a song. 
And, and, but we can do it a verse at a time. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Read it every morning. Read it every night. And when you're feeling stressed and anxious and pressed upon on all sides, open your Bible and read Psalm 91. The reason I'm saying we should memorize it is because sometimes we may not be in possession of that Bible. And when we're in that crisis situation comes upon us, we should be able to close our eyes and call upon it. I know Psalm 23 by heart. I call upon that in times of crisis sometimes. There's no reason that we can't learn this and we can't memorize it. Amen? Amen. All right. Let us close with, with prayer. Um, for those who haven't uh, been here, I close with the Aaronic blessing in Hebrew. This is how my grandfather would end Sabbath after, after synagogue. And then I'll recite it in English as well. Let's bow our heads. Yivrecha Adonai v'yishmarecha, y'ar Adonai panav alecha v'ikunecha, y'sa Adonai panav alecha v'yashem lecha shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and bring you peace. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. So, so wait, wait, wait. You're dismissed. <laughs>